Uh, good morning, everybody. So as Matthew has mentioned, is, um, basically this talk is just going to give you an overview of some of the information that's available on bacteria to sailors, and then I'll also touch on some of the research that we're doing. So basically what I'll be talking about is just sort of what is in a name, and you'll see what I'm talking about in the next slide. Then also, what is bacteria to say this? Where is it in South Africa? How do we monitor it? Why do we monitor? What do we do if we find a fly? Um, what research are we doing? Um, also, what should, be, what should we be doing in our pest free areas? So, the what is it a name question is when this fly first arrived on the African continent in 2003, it was described as a new species, Bacteria invadens, um, or the African invader fruit fly, and this very ominous name caught, caused considerable panic in the food industry. But this year, um, in 2015, this paper came out um, from Mark Sutcher um, and a very long list of authors, as you can see up there, and what they basically did is they synonymized Bacteria docelis with Bacteria invadens. Um, so what this basically just means is that they're one and the same, and this was based on evidence from morphology, genetics, cytogenetics, um, chemoecology, as well as sexual compatibility. So that's why there's such a long author list on there. So this kind of um, made people um, breathe a sigh of relief as the oriental fruit fly, Bacteria docelis, is a well-known invader <coughs> around the world. It's of Asian origin and it infests um, quite a wide variety of fruits. So these include things like mangoes, peaches, apples, pears, and guavas. And in Africa, it's been shown that it's got quite high infestation levels on both citrus and mangoes. So the first time the fly came to South Africa was in 2007, when a single male specimen was intercepted in the Vemba district in Limpopo. And the same was repeated in 2008. Another single male um, specimen was intercepted. And it was only three years later in 2010, when a number of specimens um, were detected, that they decided to launch an eradication effort. And this eradication effort was later declared to be successful. However, despite of intensive eradication efforts, control and quarantine methods, this fruit fly continued to spread. Um, so at the moment, this is where it is. Uh, firstly, I would like to say that um, this is the official map from DAF and it was last updated in October of 2014. I did email them to ask for updated maps, but those aren't available yet. So what I would like you to focus on for now is just, um, so the large beige area on the map is all areas that are um, considered pest-free. And if we zoom in on the areas with the red dots, which is areas that has presence of the fly, so it's mostly north of the country, so at the moment it's present in northwest, um, Limpopo and Gauteng, as well as in Kozuru Natal. Um, all of these areas are under management and control. And based on where it's now, the idea is to continue monitoring. So basically in 2008, when we had those first reports, they decided to set up a Bacteria Invalid Steering Committee. And this committee consists of representatives from both DAF and industry. And their main role is basically to implement and oversee the action plan, which I will touch on in the next slide, and also to maintain early detection. And monitoring is a really integral part of this early detection system, which can help us with successful eradication. And then also to basically collate this data. And the collate, collation of this data is what you've seen in the previous map, as kind of having a present, present absent um, map. So basically, for the monitoring, they set forth standard trapping guidelines, which I show a picture up here, and it's also available on the web if you want more information. But in essence, it basically just states that um, monitoring for this fruit fly pest, uh, you need um, a bucket type trap that is baited with methyl eugenol, which is basically a male only attractant, but it has an attractant attractive distance of about 500 meters, which is quite far. Um, and this basically goes in a trap with an insecticide like DDVP, and it's kind of standard che traps checked <coughs> weekly or force nightly, and then insecticides and attractions change every <coughs> six weeks. And at the moment, the recommendation is to have one trap per every square kilometer in production areas. 
So the question is then why do we monitor? And I guess this is a question specifically important for areas that are pest free, so for the Western Cape for example. And the reason why we need to monitor is we need to have evidence that our areas are pest free. And for this, basically what is required based on international standards on phytosanitary measures is 12 months of um, trapping data with zero counts. So the next question is what do I do if I find a fly? So firstly, do not panic. Okay, so we've had a lot of um, misidentifications. So if you find a fly, it doesn't mean that it's the end. So basically what I have up here is sort of just a scheme of what the action plan basically says you need to do. Mm -hmm. And I'll just quickly run through it. I'm not sure if you can actually read um, in the back. But basically, firstly, if we start from the top and just work our way down, so firstly the specimen will be collected and then there will be sort of a ground identification. So either your industry um, representative and then from here there will be a local fruit fly expert that will also <laughs> identify the fly. And if at this point we still think it's the fly, the steering committee needs to be notified and they will then be in charge basically of the eradication, the monitoring and also the communication of where the fly is found and what's happening. Um, from this point forward there would be um, a quarantine placed on the area and a delimit delimiting survey will then be initiated. So basically um, the area surrounding the trap where the fly was caught. Um, a specific area around this around the trap that will also be um, traps put up and then basically seeing whether we can find the fly in areas surrounding sort of the focal point. So at this point there's sort of two options so if we move to the left first which is um, basically if we don't find a second fly which is good the identification needs to be verified by a taxonomist and then after three fruit fry generations, which is approximately 12 weeks, the quarantine can then be lifted. Okay, so then you're pest free again. So for the second leg, so on the right hand side, if a second fly is found in your trap or in the limiting survey, we will then initiate eradication. So basically, it's very similar to what happens if no flies are found. The ID has to be verified by a taxonomist. Um, there has to be notifications according, according to the IPPC guidelines. Um, we then have the eradication effort, which is basically eight weeks of treatment and then four weeks of monitoring. Um, and then you have three options from this point forward. First prize is that after your four week monitoring, you don't find any more flies. Um, and this basically means that the eradication was successful and you are now again um, lifted or excluded from, quarant from quarantine. Um, the second option is that there are more flies caught within the four week monitoring period and this means that eradication needs to be repeated and then it's again an eight, block, eight week block and then a four week treatment and then after this point hopefully no more flies. And then finally if more flies are found out in the delimiting survey, so in the area surrounding your um, focal trap, it means that the quarantine and the irrigation efforts has to be expanded and the limiting survey also has to be expanded um, to those areas that are now included. And it's again the same thing, eradications and the four week monitoring period. So kind of just to give you an idea of some of the research that we're doing at the moment. So currently here um, or at Stanbosch University we're not doing a lot of research I'm basically going to touch of two, on two <coughs> projects. The reason why is it's very difficult to work on something that you don't have, so, which is good, but not so good for us maybe. Um, so the first project that I'm talking about is a project that's basically um, a PhD and Valma Peters uh, is the student. So her project basically looks at comparative host specific demographics, looking at both Bacteria docelis and <coughs> Ceritides capitata that we're all familiar with, the Mediterranean fruit fly. Um, so at this point I would just like to caution that the data that I'm showing is only part of a PhD and it's only sort of the first part. So it's some information about egg hatch and pupae um, collections, but it's only sort of early days. So a lot more information will be available soon and also information for the entire life cycle. So what I'm showing you up here is basically um, 
the number of PPE that um, was attained from different fruit types. So she used apples, pears, plums, nectarines and peaches and each of these fruit were placed individually into a cage with bacteria dorsalis and females were then allowed to overposit on these fruit. These fruit were then removed and then the number of pupae <coughs> they emerged from these fruit were then counted. So what I'm showing up here is on the y-axis number of pupae and on the x-axis we have the two different fruit flies. So what her work is showing at the moment is that Bacteria de Salis produced significantly more pupae on those five fruit types that I just named um, than Ceritatis capitata. What, which was also interesting is for the different fruit types that they have on the y-axis at the bottom here, apple, pear, peach, nectarines and plums, it's only in peaches and nectarines that Bacteria de Salis are producing more pupae per sting mark. So a sting mark is sort of one overposition of site um, than Ceritatis capitata. So just some of the other information that she's um, got at the moment <coughs> is that Dorsalis eggs hatch faster than those of Ceritatis capitata, that it punctures the fruit fewer times but produces more pupae and adults. Um, she's also done uh, more intensive work on apples and pears and what she's shown here is that it produces more eggs on apples than on pears but that the eggs hatch faster on pears than on apples. And what she's also done is she's inoculated fruit with larvae. So in each case, she's inoculated fruit with 100 larvae, and then she just collected the number of pupae that, that came from these. And in pears, 78 pupae were recovered, and in apples, only 37 pupae were recovered. So the second project is a project that, I would be, that I'm going to be involved in, and this is a project looking at population structure and invasion routes. So just to explain to you what population structure is, basically if we have two locations, A and B, if there are exchange of individuals between these two locations, we would expect them to be genetically more similar than two locations where there's no movement of flies between them. And then invasion routes, what I mean by this, is basically what we're looking at is how flies traveled from one location to another location. So for example, if you came from Cape Town to Salamash this morning, you could have either taken the N1 and the R44, or the N1 and the R304, <coughs> or you could have taken the Portal Array and the R304. So basically what we're doing is we're using genetics to answer the question, how did you get here? Okay. So the questions that I'm going to try and answer during this project is where did the South African Dorsalis flies come from? Was it new introductions from um, the native range, so Asia, or from other locations where it's present? or did it come from um, the African introductions. We will also look at the movement of the sailors on the African continent as well as within South Africa. So I showed this the African map earlier. We're trying to see is the flies moving in a specific direction? Um, are they going up and down or just in one direction? And then what we'll also try and answer is whether the eradication efforts were, ex were actually successful. And the way we're going to do this is basically you can pick up whether it was a new introduction or if it was the same set of flies that just remained at undetectable levels. So this is just an example of the invasion pathways, and this is an example for the sailors, but just for Asia. So they just looked at some of the Asian movements. Um, so on the far right, there's a dot with the two next to it. So basically what we'll be looking at is, if, is it one-way movement in a direction, so two to one, or two to six, or two to 11 here at the bottom, or whether it's movement in, in both directions. So between four and six, um, it's movement, they're exchanging individuals in both directions. So this is the type of information that we will have um, from the project. And then finally, just to end off, um, what, would, what should we be doing in our pest-free areas? So firstly, um, it's really important to monitor with methyl eugenol. Um, the reason why, um, and then also obviously keep accurate trapping records um, and also make sure that you actually do service the traps. Um, it's important also to keep the suspect specimens and please label these um, with um, all possible information, anything that you can think of, just write it on the label. Um, these then needs to be submitted to either the Bacteria Invading Steering Committee coordinator, which is Leslie Brown, or Pierre Addison. 
And then finally, also just continue to apply your control measures for fruit flies at the moment that you have in your orchard at the moment, um, because it will also control the sailors. Thank you.